Well, I was kind of agreed with. For this episode, I'm going to flip the script. Being honest as I am, this season made me want to eat my couch. You see, the episodes that actually wanted to tell a story either start off strong and end weakly, or are the reverse. Especially the top three, which are so close to being good, I felt like an NFL coach watching your team choke in the wildcard game. So, because I want you to have the context, I'm going to quickly jump into the top three episodes of this season, then work backwards a little to explain my frustrations. Okay? Okay. Starting off, we have... The very pulse of the machine follows Kibbleson and Burton, two surveyors traveling across the surface of Jupiter's moon Io, when suddenly the moon splurges all over itself and Burton becomes dead weight. Literally, Burton's body must be dragged in tow because Kibbleson's air tank was damaged and is leaking, so she needs Burton's air supply. With Kibbleson hitting the old dusty trail, her arm hurt from the crash, she decides to take a medicinal cocktail to help her get through the journey. As if she couldn't be having a worse time, she starts hallucinating that Io is communicating with her through Burton's vacant meat suit, ultimately finding out that yes, Io is actually communicating with her while taking medicinal cocktails that only Keith Richards could brush off before ultimately running out of air and giving herself to Io. A fine episode that throws more poetry at you than Shakespeare collaborating with Tupac, but despite the attempt to make it vague, the ending is clearly not, and many of the visuals pad out the runtime while the poetry attempts to make the story appear deeper than it actually is. Swarm follows Dr. Afriel being brought to an asteroid that is home to the titular swarm comprised of well over a hundred different species of creatures living in symbiosis. Afriel learns this and more from Galena. She's been living and working among the swarm for some time and is curious about Afriel's reason for being here, which he reveals to be the enslavement of this alien race to force the iron fist of authoritarian rule on mankind. Oh, the irony. Galena, of course, has her head screwed on right as she's completely against this. Uh, until she switches gears like a political narrative and says, Sure, I'll help smuggle an egg so you can use the swarm like an intergalactic bludgeon, just as long as no harm comes to the swarm. We'll come back to that in a moment. Moving on, everything seems hunky-dory until Galena mysteriously disappears. In his search, Afriel is chased down and captured by the warrior cast and brought to what I can only imagine is the brain of Cthulhu from Terraria. Speaking through Galena, Afriel learns the swarm is not as mindless as was believed and gives Afriel the choice to retain his individuality or become a meat puppet. In either circumstance, Afriel and Galena will be made to breed an army in preparation for the coming battle with humanity. Afriel also makes a heel-spinning change to support the freedom and determination of humanity while also accepting the terms. These character choices give me whiplash. There is not enough time to convince anyone Afriel or Galena would throw away their beliefs like used tissue paper. But the plot needs to happen, so the story sacrifices consistency to run towards it's a conclusion that, while interesting, stumbles across the finish line. Bad Traveling sees the crew aboard a fishing vessel sailing the high seas when a giant crustacean known as a Thanapod hops aboard and starts clapping poop decks. After thoroughly evening the score against mankind for opening up Red Lobster, the Thanapod goes below deck and the crew draws straws. Our lead character Torin is voluntold to go below deck, and after narrowly avoiding certain death by mulching, the Thanapod uses a dead crewmate to communicate with Torin that it seeks passage to Faden Island. Now the crew is conflicted with whether or not to avoid fate an island in favor of another nearby island, or give the unknowing populace a lethal dose of crabs. After yet another vote, the crew heads for the alternative destination, but morale of the crew wanes and Torin sees a couple attempts on his life which all end like Amber Heard's career. Once near the secondary shore, Torin goes below deck and basically tells the Thanapod nah, 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 before setting the ship on fire and escaping. This episode narrowly edges out Swarm as the best of this season by a race Razor's Edge with an inverse of progression. Basically, Swarm starts off really strong and finishes weak, while Bad Traveling starts off horribly but manages to get its shit together in the end, despite having more questions than Sherlock Holmes investigating how Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. Now, if you paid attention, you probably caught that I didn't praise any of these episodes like I have in previous seasons. That's because Season 3 is thus far the most frustrating. The only episode that is consistent is Night of the Mini-Dead, and that's basically an animation test for college, so you get as much out of that as 
breathing. A similar conclusion may have been reached by the teams behind this group of episodes. The gore has certainly returned to tickle your brain in some episodes like Kill Team Kill. It's as though the team behind that was forced to listen to Slayer's raining blood on loop. But that's just it. The gore is back while the writing has suffered. Most episodes are ruined because events play out like a game of bumper cars. Every bump is an error and all whiplashes a question. Take the little crab things in the vaulted halls entombed. Why would they stop chasing the squad if they're guarding the prison? For that matter, why not continue chasing the two terrorists that were still alive? This season in particular is saturated with these questions, often killing the mood like your partner ripping ass while you were giving her cunnilingus. Let's go back to the heel turn for Galena and Afriel. The whole point of Afriel's journey is to weaponize the swarm to control mankind. That point is built on the belief mankind is weak and chaotic, but by the end he's like, nah, mankind is better than that. Bullshit! Galena agrees with almost no pushback at all, and your perspective never changes until the plot demands such in the presence of this discount overmind. How about the very pulse of the machine's plot being too straightforward to leave a vague ending? Just couldn't resist changing Kivelson's speech pattern at the end, could ya? Or how about Bad Traveling's laundry list of curiosities? I'm interested in the world, and it makes me wonder what kind of monsters below are so horrifying that the Thanapod jumped on board for safe passage. But I'm also conflicted when the crew calls out the crustacean by species, yet has no weaponry to deal with it. That's like trying to slay the dragon preying on the village with harsh words. All but the one episode do this through and through, and it diminishes the overall experience. Season 3 is not good, and can be argued as less intelligent than Season 2. Which is a shame, because I really do like LDR, being the boundary-pushing series that it is, like the Twilight Zone with tits. I just wish it would push more mental boundaries, instead of relying on the same old gratuity that Season 2 at least tried not to rely on. Actually, click the link above to catch my thoughts of LDR Season 2, and please subscribe to join my kingdom.